Good morning. We welcome you to our service this morning and hope that you are having a blessed day so far and that you want to join us in worshiping the Lord together. And we will begin with our call to worship, so I invite you to stand. We worship the one who knows our thoughts before we speak. We worship, we worship the, the one who knows our, our comings and our goings. goings. We worship the one who knows every hair on our head and every star in the sky. We worship the one who knows every grain in the sand and every each endeavor, endeavor we, try. we try. We make plans, but God orders our steps. We, we ask God, God to refresh us in our, in our worship, to speak, speak to us through his, his word, word, and to bless us in this service. service. Let, Let us praise God, God together. together.
security and our, we trust in you and knowing that you will provide. You are our God. We thank you this morning. Praise your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. It's a little loud. God is a God of grace and hope and mercy and yes, we give all glory, honor, and praise to him, and we praise him for kids. Thank you. Come on down, kids. This is not time for our kids' message. We welcome all the kids. Come on forward. Any of you kids who want to come and join us on the steps, you're welcome. All right. A lot of kids here. We love it. All the kids are back from vacations, and we thank you. Carol's back. Hallelujah. Welcome back, Carol. We missed you. We, do, we welcome all the kids who are here in person, all you kids who are new, we welcome everyone online. I see we have a couple, a few new people here. We want to say welcome to all the way from Japan. So uh, let's see, we have Carol's cousins, right? I wrote their names down, Chris Sal and Cassandra. They're visiting. Welcome. We're glad that you are here. They're going to be here this week, so welcome. And your siblings are here too. We thank you for coming, kids. And we see two other kids, new kids, Zoe right? And uh, Moses, right? I get the names right. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. And I see, let's see, where's Betty and Mac? Two new kids. All right, Betty and Mac, we welcome you here too as well, your first time. So we're just glad that all you kids are back. Everyone have a fun summer? You back in school now? How many kids are back in school? All right. Are you happy? <laughs> yes, I love it. Okay. School is good, right? We want to be in school, right? We miss Diana and Bella. They're still traveling in Bulgaria, but they'll be back this week, right? Well, today is a very special, special day because it's a special birthday. Whose birthday is today, Lisa? Your dad's. We want to say happy birthday, Pastor Dave. Everybody ready? Happy birthday. You get to wear the birthday crown. Can you give that to him? We, we celebrate Pastor Dave. It's my brother Walt's birthday today, too, and it's also Tanya's birthday. Tanya, she joins us online each week, and she's all the way in Canada. Cliff Coolidge. Oh, Cliff, we wish happy birthday to Tanya and Cliff Coolidge and my brother Walt. Any other birthdays today? We don't want to miss anybody. Your sister, too? All right, well, happy birthday. Wow, it's a big day for birthdays. I love it. A big day to celebrate. Well, our kids' message today is the breakfast of champions for God, right? What does it mean to be a champion? Yes. Winning many challenges. Yes, I love that. Yes, Johan, what's a, what's a champion? Did you say yes, Johan? Being, doing something? Yeah, doing something. Yeah, actually doing something. You can be a champion just by doing something and not sitting around, right? You don't want to let life pass you by, right? 
Well, a champion is also, they do great things, right? They overcome hard challenges and hard times. They can be the best at something, the best at what they are supposed to be, right? Never giving up, right? When you're going through a, a really hard goal, you have a goal in mind, never giving up. You persevere to win the prize, like the Bible says. Maybe you're winning a special contest or something. Uh, we're going to have uh, Juhan, come on, and Yeji, you're going to help me with the treasure box today. Let's see what God has in his treasure box to talk about being a champion for God. Okay, we're going to take this one out first. Well, things kind of fell around in there. Okay, let's hold that up. Has anybody heard of this kind of cereal? No. No, yeah, it's not very popular now, but this is Wheaties. Okay, folks, what is Wheaties known as? The breakfast of champions, right? They're celebrating 100 years of having champions on their box, right? So who's on the box this time? Simone Biles, right? So she is an Olympic gymnast, right? She's very famous. She is a champion in gymnastics. She has the most medals in gymnastics of anyone ever in the whole United States. She has 32 medals. And she has overcome many challenges in life. She was in foster care, and then she was adopted by her grandfather, right? She says that it was her faith and her family that made her wildest dreams come true. And now she is an Olympic champion. Something else she says on the box that has a quote from her, don't wait until you've reached your goal to be proud of yourself. Be proud of every step you take toward reaching that goal. Amen. And I love that she shares about her faith in God and how God helped her to become a champion. And God put special people in her life to help her along the journey. Okay, why don't we give that box to Pastor Dave since it's his birthday and he's a champion. He gets a box of Wheaties because he's a champion for our church and for us, right? Okay, let's hold. Who's that up? Go ahead. Be gentle. Nice, nice. No, be respectful. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now who's that? Jesus. Where do we learn about Jesus? In what? Here, Yeji, why don't you hold this? The Bible, right? The Bible is filled with stories of champions for God. Who are some of the champions in, for God in the Bible? Just tell me some names. Just say the names. Who do you know? Who's in there? Say, say a name. Just say the names. Matthew. Matthew. Yes. John. John. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Moses. Daniel. Anybody else? What? Moses. Noah. Abraham. How about some women? Yes, Lisa. Esther, yes, Esther and Ruth, Mary and Martha, we got Timothy, we got Paul and Peter. Hmm? Queen, Esther. queen Esther, yes, Queen Esther, right, but she wasn't a queen at first, right, but she was very brave and she was a champion for God. Well, this summer we're also learning about King David, right? King David was very successful in life because he walked closely with God, he obeyed God, and God blessed him in many, many ways. Even when David messed up and made mistakes, God blessed him because he was faithful to follow God. David was a champion of God. So what are things that make a champion of God? How are we a champion for God? How can we be a champion? What can we do? We can believe in who? Jesus. Right. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus, right? What else can we do to be a champion? What are we doing? What am I doing here? Pray. When we pray, right? We pray. We read the Bible. Reading the Bible, we can be a champion for God. Uh, praising God, we want to praise him like we were worshiping earlier. When we follow God's laws, like the Ten Commandments and other things that he writes in the Bible. How about the fruit of the Spirit? When we live as the fruit of the Spirit, then we're also being a champion for God. The breakfast of a champion for God includes all these things, right? And God says the Bible is our daily bread. We need to read our Bible and pray to him and praise him every single day. When we get up in the morning, think about that breakfast that we're going to have and how are we going to include God in our day and make him put him first, right? Well, yes, Jesus was the biggest champion for God, right? He even followed God and he prayed to God. Here, I'm going to hold him. Let's hold him up so, yeah, we can. There we go. We have to be respectful of Jesus. We need to follow him. We need to do what he did. You know, Jesus surrounded himself with good people, right? People who were faithful and who followed him, just like King David did. King David had some mighty men who were following him and who worshiped God with him, and they actually fought many battles together. God gave David faithful people to walk alongside, right? Well, we all need these kinds of people in our lives. We need to listen to our parents and our grandparents and to learn from them how to follow God. We need to surround ourselves with teachers, right, and friends who follow God. 
And you know what, kids? We need to be friends ourselves the way God wants us to be a good friend and to listen to our families, our parents and our grandparents, to follow what they teach us, right? We have siblings even. We want to get along with people. We want to love people like Jesus did. And we want to show that we are champions for God, right? Having faith in Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit is one of the most important parts. That's the most important. That faith is the most important part of being a champion for God. And we have a, a gift in here. Okay, I'm going to open up one more thing. Okay, why don't you hold be, be careful how you hold him, please. Thank you. And here, we're going to give this to Pastor Dave. It's a birthday gift. And we'll have cereal for all the kids later. We'll get those out later. But Pastor Dave, you get the shield of faith for your birthday because you're a faithful champion in God's kingdom. We appreciate you. It says in the Bible that when you take up the shield of faith, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So when we have faith in Jesus, we can overcome challenges and be champions for God too. All right, we're going to have, Yeji's going to do the, say the prayer for us, and then we'll go. You saw that? All right. Say it nice and loud and hold it real close to your mouth. Dear God, you're amazing. You know all things. You give us strength and energy. You give us the Bible, and you teach us about many people of faith who are champions. They overcome... They overcame many hard things. Because of your love and provision, they did mighty things. Thank you for Jesus, the biggest champion of all. Help us to follow him. Help our faith to grow. Teach us your ways. Protect us from your temptation. Show us the right way to go. Help, faith, help us to overcome the hard things in life. Bring people in our lives who are faithful to you and who can teach us to walk with you. Bring your healing and comfort to those who are suffering. Bless Pastor Dave and Tanya and all those celebrating birthdays. Bless your church and your children and here and around the world. Help us all to be champions for God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, kids. Now let's go. All kids, follow us That through those doors right there. We're going to have our Bible lesson and activity together. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, all. It's always fun to see what Lori's going to come up with. Box of Wheaties. I haven't seen one of those in a, a decade or two or three or four. Anyway, happy birthday, Pastor Dave, and to Cliff and Tanya. We know what your parents were doing on Thanksgiving one year. <clears throat> well, welcome to Union Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Here are a few announcements for the week. In the pews, you'll find the connection cards, which we encourage everyone to fill out and drop in the offering plate each week. This is a great way to let us know that you are here and how we can, may help you and get connected to various ministries in the church. You can also submit prayer requests or requests to be added to the weekly highlights email or connect with us online by visiting unionpc.org and click on the Connect With Us button. All are welcome to join a new series on Christianity in America with Ligonier Ministries teaching pastor Stevens Nichols. The adult class meets Sundays at 8.45 a.m. on Zoom. Each standalone lesson includes a short video lecture and a discussion on its meaning in our lives. The class ends promptly so people may attend the worship service in person. Contact Mark Morris at markmorrisruns at aol.com to be added to the Zoom list. We accept all points of view and people new and seasoned in faith. Join us for our second annual Masterworks concert series held Saturday, August 27th at 7 p.m. in the Sanctuary. This is a classical concert featuring flute, clarinet, French horn, piano, and harp by local professionals throughout the Bay Area. And 100% of the donations will go to support Ukraine through the ECMI Ministries. Svetlana um, Yuzvinsky, a local Ukrainian, will be our guest speaker. Please take lots of the flyers for this concert that are available in the Narthex and invite your neighbors, acquaintances, and friends to help us make this event a success. A new Stevens Ministry training class is coming soon. The Stephen Ministry is a one-on-one -on -one caring ministry for people in our congregation and community who are experiencing life difficulties. A Stephen minister is well-trained to listen, care, pray, encourage, and offer the love of Christ during a time of need. Meet faithfully each week with a care receiver for as long as there is a need and keep everything that is being discussed confidential. 
If you'd like more information or if you're interested in this class, please contact Pastor Dave or Kaidi Moore. For those of you who have not heard, we are sad to, to inform you that longtime Union Church member Kip Gutschall has gone to be with our Lord. Save the date Saturday, September 17th for Kip's celebration of life service. Join me as we say aloud the Bible verse for August, Psalms 9, verses 1 through 2. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. As part of our worship, we continue to give back to God out of the blessings he has given us. During the offering music, we invite the ushers to come forward to pass the plates to collect the offering and connection cards. Other ways to give include mailing your check to the church, or you may give online at unionpc.org give. Let me pray for the offering. Lord, thanks for the opportunity to give back to you out of the abundance that you have blessed us with. I ask, Lord, that these monies would go to proclaim your name, your grace, your love to the very ends of the earth and here locally as well. Lord, use us uh, as a, a lifted up offering, um, our lives also. Lord, use us to, to bring your name glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our, old, well, our alternative reading is from Romans 3, 21 to 31 this morning. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God a God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too, since there is only one God 
who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by that same faith. Do we then nullify the, the law by this faith? Not at all. We rather uphold the law. So we've been going through David, and at the beginning of this sermon series, I said that the Bible is primarily about Jesus. The life of David, in many ways, points to who Jesus was. David is, in some ways, a prototype of what the Jews were looking for in the Messiah, someone who is both prophet, priest, and king. And David, of course, was the king, but in a little bit of the prophet, a little bit of the priest, but he's kind of a prototype. They were looking for a Messiah like David. But my point being, everything in the Bible is about Jesus in one way or another. But we have a problem in that we have a tendency to read the Bible as though it's a connected series of moral stories. That instead of what David learned about God, that being what we take away from the text, we instead read the passage and think, ah, I'm supposed to be more like David more humble, more focused on God, more of a seeker of God like David was. And if we read the Bible like that, there, there gets to be some problems. I mean, if we read about the story of Abraham, we think, oh, I need to be more like Abraham, more willing to travel, more willing to have a child when I'm older, more willing to sacrifice my children. Well, no, that's not the point, right? We've been looking at David in order to learn about God, not David. David was a person just like every other person. He had some good points. He had some bad habits. He lived through some amazing events in his life. But the Bible is not a bibliography, of, a biography of people. It's how God interacted, the lessons God taught. It's the lessons that people have learned about who God is and how he instructs and how he relates to people like us. See, the temptation is to turn Scripture into a series of moral examples like Aesop's fables. The Bible is not meant to be a series of moral stories. Live like this. As much as it is the deeper insights into God. So I want to read the passage and then keep talking about this idea. This is 2 Samuel 23, uh, 13 to 17. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Let's pray. Jesus, this is your word. It is your story. It is your history uh, with people. Um, help us, Lord, to take away from your word what you would have us take away. Bless us this morning. This is your time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So do you remember the end of the Gospel of Luke? Jesus has been resurrected, um, and he is alive and well, and, and two of the disciples were taken off. They had left Jerusalem, and they were heading towards Emmaus. And Jesus shows up to them and walks with them for a while, even though they didn't know it was him. Um, and, and they have this interesting conversation, and he, Jesus pretends like he doesn't know what's happened in Jerusalem, and they say, oh, these, all these things have happened. And Jesus, what does he do to them? Do you remember? It says that he opened the scriptures to them, the Old Testament. Essentially, those guys had read the Old Testament repeatedly. They probably had it memorized. They knew it by heart, but they didn't really believe that the Messiah would be raised from the dead. They didn't really believe the message of the Old Testament, and they couldn't grasp that Jesus was the focus of the Old Testament, that he really was going to do everything the Old Testament said he was going to do. See, the Old Testament wasn't real to them. It was a collection of stories and sayings of songs, but nothing that really impacted their lives. They had read the Bible, likely they had memorized it, 
but they didn't understand it. And Luke 24, it says, uh, beginning with the law of Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms, Jesus showed them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. See, the thing is, they had been reading the Old Testament on, on a moralistic level, on an Aesop's fable sort of level. They failed to understand that everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Every priest in the Old Testament points to the true priest, Jesus. Every prophet in the Old Testament points to the true prophet, Jesus. Every king in the Old Testament points to the true king. Every servant in the Old Testament points to the true servant. Every hero points to the true hero. Every person fighting for, for justice points to the person who is justice. And so what I'm saying is we have a choice. and We can either read the Bible as if it's all about Jesus or we read the Bible as it's all about us and the stories are about us and we might learn a lesson in how we can live our lives. And if that's how we read the Bible, that becomes a problem. Because when we read it like that, we end up feeling lost and despondent because then the Bible, when we read it, just becomes a big finger wagging at us all the time, all the things that we've done wrong. It's, it's, it's my mom threatening to put me in my room because of what I've done. I'm a little kid again. Me, you know people who complain that the Bible just makes them feel bad all the time and so they've stopped reading it. This is why. They're reading the Bible as a series of moral lessons rather than allowing the text to lead them to Jesus. I mean, I wonder if there are some people here that are like that, have been brought up like that. Um, and you thought, wow, Christianity, you thought from time to time, is just about making people feel bad. One of our neighbors um, I invited to our Alpha program, and she hasn't come yet, but I'm still working on her. And I invited her, and she said, listen, I already have enough guilt why would I want more? And I said, listen, if you think Christianity is all about guilt, you don't understand it at all. You, you've got it totally wrong. But I have to say, I don't think she's by herself in thinking that Christianity is just about making people feel bad and therefore shaping their behavior. The disciples even got it wrong. So I'm not saying this is the worst mistake or even a unique mistake. What I am saying is we have to stop reading the Bible moralistically, looking for life lessons, and start reading it redemptively. Start reading it looking for Jesus throughout. Start, we should start reading about what God and Jesus have been doing throughout history in order to save us. So I want, you to, I want to think about this passage like that. And, and unless you read the passage as primarily about Jesus, you won't really see your life changed. We have to read not only what it tells us about what we're supposed to do, but also perhaps more about what God has already done. And only at that point does the Bible start to impact our lives, change who we are. So I want to talk about that. This story from the Old Testament, and, and think about what it teaches us. So the first thing is we have to understand it. Um, so let's talk about that. David's story. David, you know, becomes king. At, before he was, he was king, King Saul was his predecessor, and, and he became aware that David was going to succeed him, that God had chosen him to succeed him, and, and Saul, of course, wasn't happy about that. And he tried to kill David a number of times before David flees into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, there was a number of men that came around him and protected him, his own little army, uh, up to 400 at some points, and they became very, very good soldiers. Saul never caught David, of course, and the soldiers around him were good. They, they saved his life. Eventually, Saul dies, and David becomes the king. When that happens, these military men, these mighty men, become David's military leaders. They become his generals, his captains, those sorts of folks, and they have the experience. Obviously, they, they were an extended family, and so this passage doesn't come from when David is running from Saul in the desert, but much later. It's actually a few months after David is crowned the king, the Philistines invaded Israel to try and take David down. And perhaps they thought they would weaken him or handicap his new kingdom. I have to tell you, life was brutal back then. Um, and so it says, during harvest time, three of the, of the 30 chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam while the band of Philistines was encamped 
um, in the valley of uh, Rephaim. And at that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. So the valley of Rephaim is several miles southwest of Jerusalem. Um, They're occupying Bethlehem, the Philistines are, that's their headquarters. And because the Philistines were so close to Jerusalem, um, David has fled. He sets up his headquarters in a cave. Uh, Even worse, this is harvest time. So this was actually a time in the ancient world where if you could, you would go attack your neighbors if that's what you want to do. This was a great time to attack during harvest time because if you won your battle, you could either steal all their crops or destroy them. Um, And and your opponents then might not have enough food to make it through the winter. Um, And if they did, they wouldn't be physically ready to fight you the next time you saw them. Or they could sow the land with salt. Uh, ruining it. So David is out of Jerusalem. He's back running uh, for his life in the wilderness. And what he says is, I want a drink. I want a drink from Bethlehem. Now I have to tell you something. He doesn't need a drink. They were not so dumb as to set up their headquarters where there wasn't any water, a spring nearby. David had water. What he was struggling with was God's promises. See, God had promised he would be with David, that he would be the deliverer and the ruler of Israel, that David's line would impact all of world history. And now he can't even get a a drink of water from Bethlehem. So his real question is, will I ever return to Jerusalem? Will we defeat the Philistines? Is God, in fact, really with me? Can you go to the next one? Right. So this is, this is a quote. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. 2 Samuel twenty two thirty three. 33. This is the, the chapter right before this passage. The, and it's a long song about how God is with David and how he's so happy with God and all this. And then one chapter late, later, the Philistines come in. David runs for his life. And maybe you've had these sorts of struggles as well. Is God really with me? Why am I suffering like this? And David's suffering took a concrete form in this water that he wanted from the well. And I think the water represented God's promises. And of the 30 mighty men, the best three were were with David again, and their names were Joseph, Eleazar, and Shammah. And they hear David's request, which I don't think is a request towards them. I think it was a plea to God. And they decide they're going to go get the water. David didn't ask them. David didn't dare them. David didn't command them. But they want to encourage David. And the truth is, we don't get a whole lot of information about what they did to go get this water. I mean, they they had to go break through the Philistines' lines. There were various patrols. There was a garrison, a headquarters at Bethlehem. They broke through that. They got the water and then turned around and had to fight their way all the way back to where David was. I mean, it's a heroic task that they took on, and yet the Bible doesn't make much of it. And just as an aside, the Bible never romanticizes the gory details of battles. We, we don't even get the gory details of Jesus' death. It just says in there, they crucified him. I mean, it's, it's years and, and centuries later that people kind of wrote down what that really entailed, but all that, all that gory stuff. What we do know um, is that the Philistines had patrols out. There was a garrison. They had to fight through them, break it. You know, they did, this is an amazing amount of fighting. These are mighty men indeed. David is awed by what they did, overjoyed. But he pours it out before the Lord. Now, I have to tell you, that wasn't David wasting or, or belittling their effort in pouring it out. What he has done is he has turned it into a thank offering before the Lord. Um, It was an act of worship that this water that they had gotten had become sacred, holy because of the sacrifice to get it. Effectively, David is saying, okay, I realize now through the sacrifice of these men, them risking their lives, that God really is with me. And not only that, but what they proved also is that the Philistines could be defeated. This is just three guys going against 60, 100 maybe. 
I mean, this could have been the turning point in that war, um, perhaps the reason we know the story. The three men could have, been, could have known that this courageous act could turn the tide of the war around, could put some starch into the spines of the regular fighting men. Perhaps even they knew that David was searching for a reason to believe that God was still with him, and they were going to show David that God still was. And they bet their lives on the idea that God is with his people. And when they came back with this prize, David says, because this is the blood of these men, this is a life poured out, it has proven to me that God is with me and that God will save us. So the question then is, what do we learn about God? Well, the first thing is, everything we have is a gift from God. The water was not a trophy. It was a gift from God. It wasn't won through guile or strength or sneakiness. It was a gift of God. And that's why the water is poured out. It was a gift that was offered back to God, almost like an offering, right? My friend was telling me about an article that he he read about the differences between the super rich, you know, 100, 120 years ago, and and the mega rich um, these days. And the super rich of today give away a lot less percentage-wise when compared to previous generations. And the implication that the article was working on was that now we live in a, a meritocracy and that in order to get into the best schools, to get the best jobs, people feel as though they have earned everything they've gotten. And so they're less likely to give it away. These three men were likely nearly killed. They used all their skills, they used all their experience, and David poured out the water. In some ways, David is reminding them that their skill, their experience is a gift from God. Their brains were a gift from God. Whatever you have in life, it's a gift from God. The money that you've earned, the place that you have in society, it's a gift from God because you use the brains and the body that God gave you. The next thing I want us to think about and see is that Christian leadership should point people toward God, not themselves. I I suspect that part of what David is saying to the men is, is that they were serving him because they were serving God first. And, and the whole idea is for him to point to God, look beyond me to God. Now, I will say it's fine to have Christians that you admire for their writing or for their faith or their commitment, but we have to look past them to see God. If Christian leaders are content with having people look at them, copy them, copy me, gosh, that'd be awful. Worship the leader instead of God, that will never end well. Um, I think of all the people who have become disillusioned by Christian leaders and left the faith. I was reading an article this week about a, uh, a pastor who went on a 20-minute rant in the, in the middle of a sermon because his congregation refused to buy him a Movado watch. And I thought, gosh, that's, how, how is that bringing glory to God? Um, so just be careful with those sort, sorts of folks. Your life, my life, is meant to be a signpost pointing to God, pointing to Christ, not puffing ourselves up. If everything is a gift and it is, then we have to point to God. When people admire you, point to God. When people ask you for advice, point to God. When people sacrifice you for you like these guys did for David, point to God. Make sure that God is honored and glorified in all you do. Don't let any leader, especially a Christian leader, exploit you for their gain. Let them point you to God. Let them grow you in your faith in Christ. And the last thing I think we can take away from this is really discerning what a leader wants. I mean, for them, their leader was David, but ours is God. And so how do we respond to what God wants? Well, David sighed, right? And the, and the men reacted to that sigh. He made this plea. But God commands. And there's a huge difference. There's a world of difference between a follower of Jesus and a religious person. See, a religious person asks the questions, what do I have to do? I mean, I need help. I need strength. I need wisdom. I need forgiveness. I need. So how do I get what I need? 
But a follower of Jesus concentrates on God's heart. What does God love? What does he rejoice in? How do I become a part of that? It isn't about following the rules, but seeking God. And I've illustrated this in the past as having us all imagine that we're on a table. And the table has some edges. And in the middle of the table is the, is the cross, and Christ. And we're, we're looking towards the cross. We're, we're heading towards it. But there are always some people who are on the table trying to figure out if, if this is where the edge is. Am I still in or am I still out? What if I do this? Is that too far over the line? And if you're doing that, you're not focusing on the cross. You're not focusing on Jesus. And that's what we really need. We need the joy of Christ because it becomes our joy. We need the love of God because that becomes our love, that we delight in his delight. So these three mighty men, as soon as David sighed, they went into action, and they loved David, and so they acted. And we love God, and so we do as well. We look for ways to bless others, for ways to make them smile and feel appreciated. We look for opportunities to bless others. And when we find them, we move on them. You know, there's a new class starting up, uh, an English as a Second Language class led by Mark Morris. If you have the time, It'd be great to, to help him out and participate in that, help in teaching. What a great way to bless people in our community, to help them out with their English. I mean, the difference between a religious person and a follower of Jesus is their relationship with God. Here's what we learn about God. David gets the water, and it's clear that God is with him. And we, like David, sigh from time to time, and we know that God hears our sighs. And, and we don't sigh for a water from a particular well, but we need the water of life. There is a restlessness in life until we rest in God. Someone has heard our cry, our, our, our plea, our sigh, and offers us the water of life to remind us that God is with us. Paul felt, as he wrote to the Philippians, that his water was poured out like a drink offering. Jesus' life was poured out on the cross. So what I want you to hear is that Jesus is our mighty man. He has fought his way through death and evil to bring us all to this place where we can believe with confidence that God is with us. He brings us the water of eternal life. And if we're confident of this, then we can run through our enemies. We can take on evil in this world because we're confident of our future, confident in the one who knows us and loves us. We will do anything because we know what's already been done for us. Last thought is, when David had this experience, he was in a cave. And I suppose some of us are in, are in caves also, in dark places. The knowledge that God is with you, knows where you are and how you're doing, that's for everybody. Not just those who are in a good spot. But I think especially for those of us who are in a dark place. God is with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word, to David and to us, that you are with us. And we thank you that sometimes that you prove it to us, and sometimes that's proved to us through the, the actions of other people. We ask your blessing on our lives as we seek to, to be faithful to what you've called us to, to who you are, to proclaim your name, to live so that you might smile. And to that end, you have asked us to do not a whole lot, but one of the things is to, when we sin, to bring it to you, to confess for your forgiveness to, to come again. So Lord, I ask that you would hear our confessions, you would lead our confessions at this time. Heavenly Father, you know who we are and where we are. You know what we struggle with. The sin that so easily entangles, whether it's through the things that we say or refuse to say, like I forgive you. Whether it's through the things that we do or refuse to do because it's inconvenient. 
because we don't feel like it. Even our thought life, Lord, needs to be redeemed, cleansed by you. And so, Lord, we offer up all of these sins, confident that you have given us this water of life that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and that we can rest assured in the comfort and grace of your love. Lord, we are thankful for your forgiveness and grace yet again. We pray these things always in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are forgiven people. We are not perfect people by any stretch of the imagination, but we are forgiven. We are graced because God is good, and that's the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for our final song this morning as we continue our worship with A Worship the King. Ship the king of glory and love, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, a million in splendor, converted with praise. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace. benediction, but before I get there, don't forget we have tons of goodies through there, um, sugar, fat, caffeine, everything that makes life worth living, right through there. So come back and join us for fellowship. Uh, let me give us a blessing. Lord, send us out from this place uh, full of the knowledge of your grace and love again, willing to live in it, um, no matter what the sacrifice. Lord, send us out with the comfort and guidance of the Spirit, with the love and joy of the Son, and the strength of the Lord God Almighty. And the people of God say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Amen.